Hey everyone, thanks for coming back for another CHP episode. No making you wait 49 days like last time. The Tong Wars Part 2. I left you hanging last episode with the death of one of the local New York Chinatown businessmen, Mr. Long Gain. He was a hip saying, and he met his end in a hallway on 9 Pell Street in Chinatown. He died at the hands of an Onliang soldier, or high binder as they were referred to in the press. It's now August of the year 1900. President William McKinley is on the throne. T.R., Teddy Roosevelt, is waiting in the wings. McKinley still has a year to go before he's assassinated by some anarchist. And in New York Chinatown, copious amounts of enmity and hard feelings have been built up between the On Leongs and the Hip Sings. They've been battling each other ever since the Hip Sings came to town and began to make moves on what they felt was their rightful share of the proceeds from the vice trade and other criminal enterprises in New York Chinatown. Why should the On Leongs have everything to themselves? Each Tong used their resources and temporary advantages to attack each other, using the courts, the police, and good old-fashioned intimidation. Each had their champions within the establishment who led the interference for their ongoing participation in the vice trade. People got beat up all the time, but there were no dead bodies in the middle of the street yet. So, Long Gain was shot and killed, and they rounded up the usual suspects. Someone named Gong Wing Jong, and An Liang, was picked up and thrown into a cell in the tombs. One thing I found interesting in reading about the Tong Wars was that many times when these gangsters were rolling up on each other, there always seemed to be a cop walking his beat. A lot of these perpetrators were often caught right at the scene of the crime. Not always, though. And and even when there were witnesses to the crime, it was invariably a case of uh, nobody ever saw nothing. Anyway, September 21st, 1900, the Hip Sings took their revenge for the hit on Long Gain, ambushing two on Leongs named Sin Q and Ah Fei. Six Hip Sing highbinders carried out the hit, among them Mock Duck. Ah Fei was killed right in front of 24 Mott Street, which is today the Panda Ma Souvenir Shop. That worked out nicely for the Hip Sing, seeing as how Ah Fei was set to testify as an eyewitness in the trial against Gong Wing Chong, presently in jail awaiting trial. That was almost always the reason why those residing or working in Chinatown would invariably say they didn't see anything. Well, this isn't the last time it happened, but in the fracas... A 24-year-old innocent bystander got hit with a bullet. A couple other lads were slightly injured. One of the Hipsing high binders named Su Sing was the one arrested for Ah Fei's murder. This was bad news for Tom Lee. He was still trying to hold everything together. He may have been a crime boss, but he still acted in the role as the Chinatown community leader. So when something like this went down in the tiny geographic footprint of New York Chinatown... It reflected badly on the community and on Tom Lee as its leader. When the Ah Fei murder went down, the New York County DA happened to be a crusader determined to clean up vice in the city once and for all. This district attorney, Eugene A. Philbin, had been a Teddy Roosevelt appointment when he was governor. And if you wanted to come down hard on crime, he had to go nose to nose with Tammany Hall. That's easy to call for in a speech, but not so easy to do in real life. Philbin also had eyes on Chinatown as well. And this case of Su Sing, now in custody, and Ah Fei, now deceased, was going to be his ticket to ending vice in Chinatown. Tom Lee couldn't have agreed more, and he did everything to assist Philbin in going after the troublemakers, the ones who killed Ah Fei, the Hip Sings. The Hip Sings saw what Tom Lee was doing, but what could they say? They did the same thing with the Parkhurst. You remember them from part one? The Hip Sings had used them to run interference against the On Leongs. So now Tom Lee was trying to put their feet to the fire in retaliation. They put a $3,000 bounty on Tom Lee's head. So Tom Lee appealed to the police, and they arranged for a security detail to follow him and stand watch outside his crib on Mott Street. Under interrogation, Su Sing wouldn't give up any of his accomplices. Eh, no surprise there. This is how it was most of the time. These guys didn't give each other up within their respective tong. 
A hip sing with Talon and On Leong in a heartbeat. But one never ratted out their sworn brother. There were exceptions, of course. In the mafia, too. He ended up pleading guilty to second-degree murder and got life in Sing Sing. Philbin still went after the five accomplices of Sue Sing, including Mock Duck. He charged them with murder. They attempted to skip town, but were later rounded up. Then, funny enough, a fire at 16 Pell Street ended up killing Sin Q, the only on guy who was with Ah Fei the night of the ambush. He had been tagged as a witness against Mock Duck. No, not anymore. Philbin, like any DA, didn't like when a star witness died. And as far as Mock Duck's trial, it ended with a hung jury. There was more jury tampering and intimidating witnesses going on than you could shake a stick at. It was a messy trial. But as was often the case, the whole thing got so twisted up in knots. And in a familiar pattern, Mock Duck ended up walking free. So it didn't look like the murders of Ah Fei and Sin Q were going to be avenged. And Tom Lee had to stew about that. In 1901, the Republicans were in, which always meant everyone involved in gambling, drugs, and prostitution had to lay low and constantly be on the lookout for another crusader with ambitions to clean up vice in the city. Efforts were sponsored by the government to ameliorate the problem, but... Whatever measures went into effect were never long-lasting. By 1902, the honeymoon was well over as far as the hip sings were concerned. They had had a nice ride for a while, masquerading as the good guys of Chinatown, but now their reputation as the worst criminals was a well-known fact. Tom Lee had put a lot of time and effort to expose the hip sings for what they were. A campaign of sorts was carried out that styled Tom Lee's China Merchants Association as a kind of Chinatown Chamber of Commerce. Tom Lee threw this extravagant dinner around Chinese New Year, 1902, that was attended by a healthy showing of politicians and law enforcement. This kind of propaganda was necessary as far as cultivating all these city government relationships. Mock Duck and the Hip Sings still teamed up with the Parkhursts to keep a full-court press on Tom Lee and the On Leongs. Neither they nor the Hip Sings apologist attorney Frank Moss were willing to give up on them just yet. On November 3, 1904, there was an attempted hit on Mock Duck in front of 18 Pell. A guy named Lee Singh was caught at the scene of the crime and taken into custody. This was not the same Lee Singh as previously mentioned last episode, who beat Tom Lee in the courts. This Lee Singh was a high binder from out of town, from Dedham, Massachusetts, just outside Boston. I'm not going to focus on Boston Chinatown in this episode, but the history of that part of town is no less interesting than that of New York and San Francisco. Boston's is the third largest Chinatown in the U.S., Mock Duck whipped the press up in a froth over this foiled assassination attempt. News back then wasn't what it is today. Good story was a thousand times better than a presentation of the facts. With the failed hit on Mock Duck, things took a turn for the worse. Everyone sort of saw what was coming, and there were attempts to throw some ice water on the situation. The New York branch of the six companies of San Francisco was also called the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, the Zhongguo Huiguan. They were next door to Tom Lee's On Leong headquarters, acting in the role as a, as a kind of primus inter pares. They tried in vain to reconcile the two sides. And this wasn't the first time, and was certainly not the last time that this respected organization got called in to deal with Tong affairs that had spun out of control. There followed an endless chain of broken truces made after somebody got roughed up or murdered. And those dozens of wise guys on both sides took to wearing the early 20th century version of Kevlar, which back then was chain mail and other kinds of armor that could stop a bullet or a meat cleaver. The worst thing that could happen while these two sides went at each other was when a Caucasian passerby got shot and killed in the crossfire. When that happened, it didn't matter who was at fault. The law came down hard and in full force. 
and everyone had to sneak away and lay low until things went back to business as usual. As the violence droned on, the Parkhurst, namely the good reverend and attorney Frank Moss, remained firmly in the corner of the hip sings, using them as their proxy to put an end to the vice in Chinatown. The press was wise to the hip sings, but the Parkhursts were still intent on working with this tongue to expose and bring to an end this unholy relationship between politicians, law enforcement, and the Onleongs. When it came time to interrogating these Chinatown thugs, the police rarely knew how to get through to the bad guys. It wasn't just a language problem. There was this tendency, you know, probably going back to the old country, that prevented Tong members from willingly cooperating with the authorities. There was this whole idea of honor and not breaking your oath by snitching. So even when these acts of murder or vengeance happened, witnesses were always around, but no one ever saw or knew nothing. Men went willingly off to Sing Sing to do hard time rather than rat out a brother. Yeah, one of those things, I guess. In 1905, T.R. was still president. In the greater New York metropolitan area, there were something like 7,000 Chinese going about their lives like everyone else. Except that Chinese in the U.S. since 1882 were still living under the stigma of the exclusion laws that were expanded upon and extended another 10 years in 1892 and then made permanent a few years before. But it'll get repealed in 1943, so eh, just another 38 more years to go. These 7,000 Chinese were spread out all over greater New York. Only a small part of that number actually lived in Chinatown. The enclave had already evolved into a social and commercial center and a place to get high, have a meal, or seek entertainment, rather than a place where people lived. The restaurants, laundries, and grocery stores opened... Wherever the opportunities were, Chinatown itself was too small a footprint for everyone to make a living washing people's laundry and serving up chop suey. The An Leong and Hip Sing Tong members were bumping each other off in an ongoing tit-for-tat fashion. If one of the fantan parlors paying protection to Tom Lee got raided and closed down, the following week you'd see some police raid on a Hip Sing run establishment on Pell. On it went, back and forth. Bounties were set up on the top tier of the On Leong organization. Tom Lee, Charlie Boston, Ju Gong, and a relative newcomer and former ex-con from where else but San Francisco named Gin Gong. Gin was a useful soldier who spoke English well and had a whole bunch of uses for the Tong. The rest of 1905 was Back and forth gang hits. Mock Duck had a hand in everything, but for most of the time when the bullets were flying, he was out of town. He got rounded up and locked up quite often and had to spend a lot of time behind bars, but he always managed to make his prison stays short. Scott Seligman quotes a New York Sun reporter who interviewed an English-speaking resident of Chinatown who summed the whole situation up this way, quote, The trouble has been going on for many years. Whenever a policeman detective needed money, he would pretend to raid a gambling house. Everybody must give him money or be arrested. If he got his money, he always got his money. Then nobody was arrested and was the wiser, because people down here are apart from the rest of the world, and nothing is said. But then came the quarrel between the societies. The police worked with the gamblers. The other society, which are all cutthroats, tried to get a share of the money. The Parkhurst Society took sides with the cutthroats. There has been nothing but terror here. It is, as the man in the letter says, nothing but hell. Peaceable men like myself, who wish that all the members of the societies could be taken out to the ocean and drowned, we dodge bullets. Now, all this is good for the detectives. They have excuses for many raids. In every raid, they catch a lot of Chinamen from out of town. Laundrymen, mostly, who have come in for one-night social pleasures among their own people. They eat. They play cards. Is it a crime to play cards with your friends? Not unless you're a Chinaman. The detectives break in. Unless you pay them money, you go to the police station. The magistrate knows you're a liar because you're a Chinaman. So he'll punish you anyway. Why not pay the policeman and save time and trouble? 
This is how it works. End quote. Once in a while, the police would stage some surprise raid, word of which managed not to get leaked. Such was the case April 23, 1905. Every place got raided on that morning. In 10 minutes, it was all over. Everyone, about 200 men playing Pico and Fantan that Easter Sunday morning, were picked up and taken to seven different police stations to be booked. This was quite an event in Chinatown, and nothing of this scale had ever been attempted before. This raid had managed to secure the cooperation of several stool pigeons inside Chinatown who tipped off the police about all the gambling den locations. In the end, this operation turned out to be a victory for the Hip Sings and all the Parkers. The only ones ending up getting arrested were Aung Liangs. All these operators of these gambling establishments were suddenly asking themselves, what in the hell were they paying Tom Lee protection money for if this kind of stuff was happening? Trying to book so many Chinese men at the same time at the various police stations devolved into a case of Keystone Cops and Who's On First. Turned out that the actual raid and all the planning that went into it was the easy part. The Hip Sings discovered who the snitches were and immediately put a bounty on their heads. That's how it worked. A few days later, the authorities went after Tom Lee and threw him in the slammer, but he was soon released on bail. The authorities brought Tom Lee and Mock Duck before them and gave them a major dressing down about doing something to end the gambling in Chinatown. Then, as a measure they hadn't tried yet, they switched authority over the police force from the crooked Chinatown precinct and switched them with presumably honest higher-ups from another precinct. All these measures did was put pressure on Tom Lee and lift Mock Duck up a few notches. You see, all the cops in Chinatown were on Tom Lee's payroll. So with them seemingly neutralized, it gave the hip sings a little extra breathing room. Well, not to be outdone, Tom Lee, whilst laying low and keeping out of sight, tipped off law enforcement regarding some of the operations still going on over in hip sing territory on Pell Street. These vice dens were raided, which led to plenty of arrests, over 60 in all, in what was being hailed as the largest daylight raid Chinatown had ever seen. Not only had the cops arrested all these thugs, they confiscated a ton of evidence. And I'm not sure if Tom Lee asked them to do this, but they took axes and just busted up every hip sink joint they raided. This was a huge reversal of fortune for Mock Duck and his hip sings. Some hardcore retribution now needed to be meted out. Over on Doyer's Street, which ran between the Bowery and Pell, there was a 400-seat opera house that the locals went to to enjoy a bit of their own culture. This had always been considered neutral ground to some degree, and nothing had ever happened there despite the fact that On Leong's and Hip Sing's mingled there together at any given performance. On the night of August 6th, the Hip Sing's, using out-of-town high binders, packing 44 caliber guns, shot up the crowd targeting certain On Leong's in attendance, killing four of them. Twenty-one hip sings, including Mock Duck, were quickly rounded up. The place emptied out at once, and the press couldn't wait to print the story about the Chinese theater massacre. Mock Duck spent four months in jail, but in the end, as usual, there wasn't enough evidence to convict him personally, and he was reluctantly let go. Tom Lee's revenge was swift and horrible. The cops, answering a call at 1 a.m. of a disturbance on 11th Street, busted in on four On Leongs burying their meat cleavers into a hip-sing laundryman named Hop Lee. Hop Lee later died at Bellevue Hospital. It was becoming just like Sonny described in The Godfather. They hit us, we hit them back. The press was having a field day, and it was clear to all a full-fledged gang war was raging. This didn't helped to drive the tourists to Chinatown. Those in the restaurant and souvenir business were dying. A lot of the legitimate businesses in Chinatown depended on these tourists, and they, they stopped coming for a while. Even the honest residents of Chinatown were afraid to walk the streets. Now, before we point any fingers at the Chinese tongs as these lawless killers, it's important to know they weren't the only ones. In 1904, before all this started happening, 334 Chinese had been arrested by the police. <laughs> but they were hardly the champs. Over 20,000 Irish, 
13,000 Italians, 12,000 Russians, and 11,000 Germans also had the book thrown at them. Chinese crime was, was triple-A ball compared to those guys, so don't let me give you the wrong impression. But the crimes being committed by the European immigrants it didn't seem to excite the newspapers as much. The focus was put on the Chinese tongs, and they got singled out as the worst of the worst. After the theater shooting, the police put Chinatown on lockdown. By now, the Qing dynasty in China was in no position to do anything about this, but their consul in New York, Sha Kai Fu, got involved and tried in vain to get both sides to cool it. The perpetrators of Hop Lee's brutal murder were able to walk free after two only on witnesses to the crime were gunned down on Chinese New Year, 1906. They met their end at the hands of two hip sings and 32 Pell. This murder went down the day before an agreed truce was supposed to go into effect. With the effective and dedicated support of Judge Warren Foster, something had been worked out between law enforcement authorities and Tom Lee and Mock Duck's deputies. They had agreed to a ceasefire that itemized the terms this way. One, no carrying or purchasing weapons allowed. Two, revenue henceforth could only be raised by dues paid by members. Three, no one was allowed to shake down the local Chinatown businesses. Four, no one would screw with each other's property. Five, each Tong was to send a representative to meet with the Chinese consul each month to discuss problems and progress. The Tongs in front of the city establishment nodded in agreement and said, yeah, 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 moment high, moment high. But as soon as the authorities walked away, and it was only Chinese in the room, they concluded amongst themselves that henceforth, Mott Street belonged to the On Leongs, Pell belonged to the Hip Sings, and Doyer Street acted as the DMZ, neutral ground. This agreement put a lid on the first Tong War to hit Chinatown. Mock Duck, through violence, intimidation, and pulling the strings of his unwitting proxies in the establishment, had allowed the Hip Sings to carve out a piece of the action for themselves at Tom Lee's expense. They had now arrived and were a fact of life from then on. The good old days when Tom Lee and his gang controlled all the vice in Chinatown were now over. The battle lines were formally drawn, and if each side knew it was good for the other, they had better stay on their respective turfs. With the end of the war, everyone breathed a sigh of relief. The tourists started to come back, and both sides buried the hatchet, at least for a while. It was such a small amount of turf, it was hard to stay out of each other's way. 1906 was sort of a strange year, a shocking year in San Francisco. A terrible earthquake of April 18th impacted so many lives and created a whole group of paper sons. As more and more Chinese communities in the major cities reached critical mass, so went the Hip Sings and On Leongs. Chapters were set up in other markets. Each city's Chinatown was always dominated by one or the other. People are the same wherever you go, so vice was big business in those places too. And there were even conventions held where each respective group could do the whole you know, networking thing and discuss affairs with other like-minded individuals from across the land. I mentioned that in such a small pond as New York Chinatown, if you were someone who carried out a hit and got seen, everyone knew who you were. So by branching out and establishing a national network of tongs, you could do what the big boys did, hire hitmen from out of state. Maybe you heard the term bu hao doi or fu zai. This term was used to describe hatchet men contracted from out of town. Well, believe it or not, relative peace returned to Chinatown. In August 1907, they even held a banquet between the two rivals to celebrate the achievement of the first year. It was peaceful in New York, but trouble would often break out between rival gangs in Philly and Boston. The same thing went on there that went on in New York Chinatown. And the other Chinese residents had to suffer from the blowback these criminals caused in the course of carrying out their agendas. Scott Seligman wrote, quote, the truth was, 
Most Chinese were hapless bystanders who watched the wars from the sidelines, but suffered along with everyone else when all the Chinese were tarred by the tongs, when tourists and businesses fled Chinatown, and when draconian solutions to the problem were proposed and carried out. End quote. Despite the flare-ups caused by violence in Chinatowns and other U.S. cities, somehow the peace still held together. In 1909, another celebration was held to acknowledge the peace, or at least the absence of a war. These affairs were attended by all local Chinatown luminaries, as well as all those parasitic politicians who, even if they detested the Chinese, still attended these affairs in order to keep these lucrative relationships in their back pocket. Such was the lull and violence in New York Chinatown that even the coroner was quoted as saying all this peace had slowed his business down to a trickle. But as I said, it wasn't just New York anymore. This was the early 20th century, and despite the exclusion laws of 1882, 1888, 1892, and 1902, the Chinese had found a way to survive and thrive. Now they were spread out across America, and if there were enough of them in one place, these parasitic tongs would go to feed off their fellow Chinese. After three years of relative peace in New York Chinatown, the same could not be said of Boston, Cleveland, and other places. People never fully relaxed. The Second Tong War is also known as the Four Brothers War. It began on June 18, 1909, 34 years to the day that Paul McCartney was born. On that day, the partially clothed and partially decomposed body of a young 19-year-old missionary named Elsie Siegel was found inside an old-fashioned steamer trunk in a building located at 782 8th Avenue, right near West 48th Street. The trunk was in an apartment above a Chinese restaurant. Elsie's grandfather was Franz Siegel, a German immigrant who fought for the Union in the Civil War. There's a statue of Franz Siegel on 106th Street. There's Franz Siegel Park in the Bronx near Yankee Stadium and a Siegel Street in Brooklyn. So you can imagine what sensational news this must have been in 1909. Something this big was, was national news. She was having a secret affair with a waiter at the restaurant named Leon Ling. And in fact, the steamer trunk with her remains inside was discovered in his room. Well, she sure had a thing for Chinese men because Elsie was also having an affair with the owner of the Port Arthur restaurant, one of the mainstays of Chinatown. His name was Ju Gain. Leon Ling and an accomplice skipped town. The accomplice was nabbed and taken downtown where he fingered Leon Ling as the murderer. He had said this was a crime of passion because Elsie was two-timing him with Ju Gain. Boy, talk about a journalist's dream come true, and the way some journalists spun this whole tale of intrigue and lust gave ammunition to the anti-Chinese racists and elements within American society. First of all, that a Chinese man was cavorting with a Caucasian woman, a young missionary at that, already had many up in arms. This was 1909, a time when races were supposed to stick to their own. So once again, Chinese citizens and immigrants had to keep their head down and hope that the Chinese bashing passed as quickly as possible. Leon Ling was neither a hip sing nor an on Leon. He was a Four Brothers member. They weren't a Tong per se. They were a clan organization. A clan or family were people grouped together by a common surname. The Four Brothers were first called the Long Gong Tin Yi Gong Sha or Long Gang Qin Yi Gong Suo in Mandarin. But they became known as the Sai Xing Tong, the Si Xing Tang. Si Xing means four surnames. These four surnames who joined together to form the society were Lao, Guan, Zhang, and Jiu. In Mandarin, Liu, Guan, Zhang, and Zhao. These four families joined together originally in San Francisco. And like the Hip Sings, spread east and ultimately to New York, where they set themselves up quietly at 22 Pell Street in Chinatown. Well, more than a 100 years later, the Elsie Ziegel murder mystery was never solved. And Leon Ling must have had a great hiding place because he was never found either. Whoever killed Elsie Ziegel, Leon Ling, or Juke Gain will never know. 
Whoever it was never had to pay for their crime. And so the only ones who paid a price, as I said, were normal Chinese Americans. The Elsie Siegel murder sort of primed the pump for the Second Tong War. The war's start could be said to have began with the murder of a 21-year-old woman named Bao Gum. You could read Scott Seligman's book for all the salacious particulars. This is a family program here, so I shan't get into the grisly details. Bao Gum was found, eh, let's say, murdered. Her body was found by her husband and On Leong, and the cops charged him with the murder. Except despite the circumstantial evidence, he didn't do it. The husband said it wasn't him. It was two guys named Lao Tong and Lao Shong. Those two were four brothers members. They got taken to the station and were booked for the murder. September 12, 1909, a four brothers man named Gun Gay was shot and wounded in front of On Leong headquarters by a cousin of Tom Lee. What else but revenge led the four brothers to respond in kind? Chinatown residents and businessmen were already battening down the hatches in preparation for another war. Business was way down. Prostitution had come to a standstill after the authorities cleaned the place out of any white women engaging in the world's oldest profession. Gambling dens were shuttered. In a word, things were quiet. And may I add, quite tense. November 5th, 1909, Tu On Leong, set to testify against the two Laos, now in custody for Baucom's murder, were themselves targeted for assassination by four, four brothers Bu Hao Doys from out of town. They were ambushed right around Chatham Square, but these hired guns weren't terribly good at their job, and although one On Leong got hit, the attempted hit failed, and the four hitmen were caught. This didn't do anything to calm the waters and ratcheted up the enmity between the On Leongs and Four Brothers. The next move was for the On Leongs to purge everyone with the Lao, Guan, Jiang, and Ju surnames from their ranks. These were all On Leong members, 54 in all, who also, because of their surname, also had association with the Four Brothers. Right after Christmas... Two Four Brothers men were shot in their room on Pell Street. No one saw it and no one was caught, but it was assumed as a given that the hit was carried out by the On Leongs. And like a ping-pong match, now it was the Four Brothers' turn. They went after a well-known On Leong, who was a comedian of some repute, who was a regular at the Chinese theater. This man, Ah Hoon, was murdered in his place of residence at 10 Chatham Square. No one caught, but everyone knew who did it. Ah Hoon, being a minor celebrity in his day, gave some sex appeal to the story, and the press had a field day with this one, making this new Tong War out to be something more than what it was. While the An Leongs and the four brothers were slugging it out, the hip sings were quiet. The dreaded troublemaker Mock Duck had walked away from them, but returned around the time of the Bao Gum murder. The police had been relentless and quite effective in fighting vice and crime in Chinatown. And to top it all off, the hip sings had legal bills that no honest man could pay, let alone them. In taking stock of their situation and realizing they were up against the ropes, the hip sings decided to join forces with the four brothers against their common enemy, the On Leongs. As 1910 dawned, the bad blood between the On Leongs and the now- Allied rival tongs had it up. He could cut the tension with a knife. The two Laos, arrested for the crime, ended up beating the rap. And this did nothing to ease the tension. And the On Leongs burned to get even for this loss of face. Right after the trial, a four brothers hitman popped what he thought was an On Leong witness who testified against him. The only problem was this On Leong witness was actually just an innocent bystander of Japanese descent. Now, if you read the unwritten rule book of Tong etiquette, you'd see that because this innocent bystander wasn't an On Leong, there was no cause for the On Leongs to retaliate. During these anti-Chinese exclusion years in the U.S., it was, it was already bad enough, but getting stuck being associated with these thugs was just another layer of bad luck Chinese Americans had to endure. It's not like the Tongs were making any worthwhile contributions to society. 
it almost seemed childish in some ways how these rivals expended so much effort to get even and teach each other a lesson. The Tong members were such a small fraction of the overall Chinese-American population, but they did extensive damage to the community. Tong wars were bad for business, and although the two opposing sides were itching for retribution, secretly they were hoping this could be settled. Attempts at outside mediation were made, you know, usually with the Chinese consul in New York, working with local officials to hammer out some kind of agreement. Local officials were still way in over their heads. They weren't what you might call China hands or specialists. A lot of them, they had no idea which end was up and just used a massive show of force as the only way to tamp down the violence. The four brothers, who were about two and a half times the size of the Onliangs, split into two factions. The younger hotheads, who wanted to carry the violence out to the very end, fought against the older, more even-keeled members. So with the four brothers divided like they were, no one ever knew who to negotiate with. And so the war dragged on. June 10, 1910, there was a particularly nasty incident that went down at a banquet held by the four brothers to celebrate the acquittal of one of their own, who, despite getting caught in the act, beat a murder rap against an An Liang. Throwing a party for something like this was in and of itself quite a provocative act and almost guaranteed to bring on some form of violent reprisal. While everyone partied on Pell Street, six On Leongs busted in and began firing away at those attending the banquet. The main target was the member who had beaten the rap. Naturally, any Four Brothers member packing some heat pulled out their guns and started firing back at the On Leong hitman. After a very long two minutes of gunfire exchange, the police invaded Chinatown in full force and broke everything up. Eight arrests were made and things quieted down after that. And with the chow fan and fresh fruit platter not having been served yet, the banquet picked up right where it had left off before the shooting. Two weeks later, another Four Brothers member was shot and killed on Mott Street, followed shortly thereafter by another brazen killing. And every time there was some random act of violence, the police would make this big show of force. No one went to Chinatown anymore. Business suffered. The Four Brothers, being a clan association that could only recruit from amongst a pool of four surnames, found it hard to grow their ranks. Their finances had been almost fully depleted. The An Leongs, too, were hit hard financially from all the loss of business revenue that dried up once the tourists stopped coming. With both sides hurting in the pocketbook, it was natural for the leadership to look to outside help to bring about some kind of reconciliation, preferably one that didn't look like anyone was backing down and losing face. The way it worked was usually they had the China consul to add gravitas to the negotiations, working in consort with selected local government officials who went back and forth and back and forth between the two rivals. This time around, they, they had the next best thing in the Chinese Consolidated Benevolence Association. On December 18th, 1910, a notice was displayed at Chinatown City Hall that announced a temporary ceasefire. And this led to a full peace treaty by the end of the year, and not just in New York Chinatown. This peace included An Leong's and Four Brother chapters across the country. Furthermore, it stated that not only was there peace, but anyone caught breaking the peace would be surrendered to the police. From now on, the way to settle matters was with blood money, not human lives. There were many other conditions, and it wasn't easy. But both sides signed on, and this whole second Tong War that began over a private dispute involving a dame, Madame Bao Gum, came to an end. Hey, with the war chest used up and no funds to keep on fighting, what else was there to do? As for the four brothers, they ended up exiting the crime business and settled down to become a nice, useful, fraternal, mutual aid organization. The An Leongs, however, did not get out of the crime business, as we'll see in the next episode. Okay, let's close it down right here. Man, only got to the end of the second Tong War. We'll finish up next episode for show. I thought this was only going to be a single episode I underestimated. No matter, 
The book is called Tong Wars, The Untold Story of Vice, Money, and Murder in New York's Chinatown by Scott D. Seligman. A link to his Amazon page will magically appear on the CHP website, along with another interesting link to other goings-on with the tongs during that time. Uh, Very well hidden, out of sight, is another nice... China News and Info podcast I wanted to tell you about. UC San Diego's 21st Century China Program's China 21 podcast. I listened to them all. Very good. Very impressive roundup of guests. David Barbosa, Stapleton Roy, to name a couple. I listened via iTunes. It's also available via Google Play, Overcast, and Stitcher. Search for China 21 a production of the 21st Century China program at UCSD, a leading academic program that uses original research to anchor major policy discussions on China and U.S.-China relations. My favorite subject. Also, you could read their China Focus blog at chinafocus.us. Victor Schur is also part of that program. Associate Professor of Poli Sci at UCSD School of Global Policy and Strategy. The China 21 Podcast. And this might be the third time, but, you know, just saying, there's still a few more copies left of Alec Ash's latest work, Wish Lanterns, Young Lives in New China, a real eye-opener for anyone looking to read what's up with youth in China, their hopes, dreams, and challenges. The story is told through examining the lives of six young'uns in the PRC, recommended by everyone who has read or reviewed it. Alec Ash. Wish Lanterns, Young Lives in New China. That's it for this one. Laza Montgomery signing off again from the Southern California city of Los Angeles. I have a quick New York, Vermont trip coming up, but rest assured, part three will be made available for general consumption soon. Take care, everyone, and see you next time for another scintillating episode of the China History Podcast.